Hey there, everybody. Welcome back again to another real-time revision. Uh, my name is Brad Reed with the Inside Creative Writing Podcast, and I want to thank you again for being a member of the Patreon team. Your support means so much to me. So uh, I want to look at something a little bit different today. I was actually doing some drafting when it occurred to me, hey, wait a second, this would be um, an interesting moment to go back and talk about a little bit on real-time revision. So I've actually done a little bit of the revision here, but I want to show you what the issue was uh, that I was struggling with. So uh, what was happening here in the story basically is that my protagonist is uh, still wandering through the woods. Um, she's just seen a bear, which has obviously freaked her out. And she kind of just goes off running through the, um, the woods and um, um, ends up crashing into this. Uh, I called it a campsite originally, and I realized that I was using some incorrect verbiage there. So rather than tell you exactly what she stumbles into, I want to show you how I wrote that initially, why I was struggling with it, and what I had to go back and change. So this is the way it looked um, initially. Uh, actually, that's the, the revision. Let me find the spot. Oh, no, that's right. So... Um, I made them jump, crashing out of the bushes like I did. They must have thought I was a wild animal at first, and I suppose I was. So I kind of like this. You'll see that I generally keep this idea. But then watch the way this goes. Her, the father's name was John, a sweater vest wearing businessman who looked completely out of place in the Oregon woods. He had jumped back from the barbecue grill with spatula raised in self-defense as I stumbled into their driveway. Hamburger grease dripped from it and stained his white shirt sleeve. The mother, Janice, had shrieked and nearly tumbled out of her folding chair her ice drink seeping into the damp ground. Their two teenage boys, like twins in their matching blonde crew cuts and New England Patriots hoodies, barely reacted to me and went back to throwing a football in the long grass in front of a mountain of debris that used to be a massive log cabin. Janice, after writing herself and smoothing her soft white summer dress, invited me to have a seat under the gigantic canopy at the folding table. It would have looked like a family on a 4th of July camping trip had it not been for the smoking rubble of the destroyed home behind them. So this is a section I was trying to revise, and I kept going back through it and just changing a few words and a few things there, trying to make it uh, shimmer a little bit with some nice descriptive language, but it never felt like it was clicking, right? It never felt correct to the scene. And what I realized is that as I was writing this, well, I realized two things. One is that I didn't have a clear picture in my mind of what this scene looked like. I mean, I knew that I wanted this log cabin that had kind of come apart. I knew that I wanted this RV that was partially crushed. And then I wanted this family that was just kind of hanging out as though this were an everyday of occurrence, kind of in denial. So what I noticed, uh, first thing, is that I didn't have the logistics of this scene figured out. I didn't know where things were, what it looked like, where Martha came stumbling out of the brush, where the RV was, where the family was. So I did something that I rarely think to do, but I always find it really valuable when I do actually do it. And I sat down and I just drew out a, uh, basically a schematic. I don't know if that's the right word. Um, an overhead view of where everything is, right? Where is this house? How big is it? Where is this RV? Where is the table that this family is sitting at? Where is um, the father at this barbecue grill? And where does Martha come stumbling out of this these bushes? And now I'm not going to show you that drawing. It's, it's horrible. It makes no, no sense to anybody but me because it's really just a thinking process. But it just looks like scratches on top of scratches. But I know what it means. And what I discovered as I was writing this out was not only the layout of the scene to make that feel more real to the reader, but I also realized that I was not describing this scene as though from Martha's perspective, which is absolutely key, especially in first person perspective, right? We have to experience everything through the story through her eyes. And I realized that she's in this moment of pure panic, right? She's running through these bushes. She's uh, thinks she, there's a bear right behind her about ready to rip her shreds at any moment. And suddenly she kind of spills out into this manicured front yard. And what I realized is that I have to have her notice these things in the order and in the way that she'd notice them in that moment of panic. Otherwise, it doesn't feel real to the reader. So I, I began to rewrite this section. I'm going to scroll back up here where I uh, rewrote it, and I'm still working on this, but uh, <clears throat> excuse me. 
Um, but you'll see, hopefully, how this um, feels a little more authentic. It feels like the way she would naturally notice things. So, I crashed out of the bushes onto a manicured lawn. So, I, I like this because the first thing, if she falls out onto the ground, she's going to notice, oh my gosh, this is grass. A chaos of screams and movement. So, her first reaction is not to start identifying specific people. And for some reason, in that first draft, I had their names right away. She's not going to know their names, right? So, you just want this kind of guttural reaction. So, the first thing she notices is the grass that she's on. Then a chaos of screams and mov movement. She doesn't even know what it is at this point, And she's still a little bit worried that that this bears around. So any kind of movement would feel like chaos. A man in a white button up and sweater vest jumped back from a barbecue, barbecue grill and raised his spatula in defense, dripping hamburger grease onto his shirt sleeve. So I'm picturing her falling into the grass, um, hearing things and looking up. And the first thing she sees is this man and how, um, what I'm going for here is how um, strange he looks to be out in the Oregon woods, and yet he's in this white button-up and sweater vest. So already we want that inkling that something's off here, right? Something's a little bit wrong. A woman sunbathing in a reclining lawn chair squawked and nearly toppled out onto the ground, spilled her ice drink into the grass. So again, I don't know the woman's name here. Obviously, Martha wouldn't know her name at this point. She's barely registering just what she's seeing. Behind them in a long driveway sat a massive RV the size of a tour bus. Its front end was crushed under what used to be a huge log cabin built on stilts to raise it up over the tree line. So this is feeling a little too heavy for me here, right? And what I mean by that, oops, what I mean by that is a little too uh, descriptive, right? Because I'm not sure she'd take in this inform much information that's built on stilts and why it was built on stilts. So this is probably going to be re reworked later into her description but all i'm trying to get are kind of these rapid fire what she's noticing she notices the man she notices the woman she notices the rv that it's crushed then she notices this log cabin that has come down on top of it it had come apart as if it had been made of lincoln logs i i love this callback to my youth and playing with lincoln logs i don't know that this survives i i don't even know that lincoln logs are still made or if they're widely played with. So this is something I'm gonna have to go do a little research on and see if this um, metaphor here or the simile actually still connects with a large enough audience, but I kind of like it for now. Shattered glass littered, uh, glittered in the sun as though sprinkled over the wreckage like confetti. I've got a lot of similes in here um, as if it had been made of Lincoln logs, um, like confetti, um, I don't like to stack these on top of each other, but there's just two there. I may be able to get away with that. Uh, a bear, I said breathlessly, pointing back into the woods behind me. Uh, the man and the woman gathered themselves and looked at me as if I were a wild animal, which I suppose I was. Two young girls I hadn't noticed, hadn't noticed, looked up from their phones under a canopy, pulled out from what remained of the wrecked RV. So um, I'm I intentionally put these girls last. That may seem odd, and I may go back and change that because she notices the people, the RV, the house, and then these girls. But I kind of want to set these two girls up as, um, you know, a little bit disconnected from the world around them that some woman can come crashing into their space from the outside and they barely, it barely registers, right? So she wouldn't register it because they're just sitting there on their phones. So it's one of the last things she registers is, oh, there's, there's these two girls there too. You also notice that I changed uh, the two girls um, from the two young men. Uh, the only reason I did that is because I have in a previous scene um, a family with two young boys. Um, this is something I'm going to develop a little bit more. I just didn't want that repetition, but I need these two girls to be more than just placeholders for additional bodies in there. So as I further revise these scene, I will either um, bring these two girls out as different from each other and um, use them in some way to illustrate the theme a little bit uh, from different angles, or I'll get rid of, rid of one of these girls because otherwise why have two of them in there for your, the reader to keep track of. So the last thing I want to show you today is um, something I call my discard file. So um, what I'm going to do here, where was I? So um, I'm getting confused. Okay, so this is the section that I cut. So I'm going to go here, copy, paste, 
Control X. This is just leaving my draft. And I'm going to another file here that uh, it's a little bit off the screen, but it's just called discards. Uh, oh, actually, you can see it here, Crossing Cascadia Discards. And all I'm doing here is throwing these chunks of language. Uh, I leave some spaces so I can clearly see where the different chunks are. And, um, whoops, Control V. And I'm throwing this language in here. In here. Sometimes I'll actually go through and um, uh, highlight or underline just some... Um, you know, some nice language that I, that I may want to use uh, later on. Um, so this can be a file where every once in a while I'll, I'll dig through, just kind of scan back through and I'll look for some of those highlights or some of that great language that I had to take out of my draft earlier. And sometimes I find a great and better place for that to fit um, once it's sat in my discard file for a while. So now that I have this here, I know that I am... Actually, I need to lose that too, because that's left over from the previous point. And then I'm going to leave a little space here because we have a time jump, right? She stumbles out, then we have this little time jump where um, everything has settled down and they've started to uh, talk about what happened, what their experiences are, and things like that. So I always drop in a little comment here. I just highlight the next piece of text. You can't really see my comment here too much, uh, but I'm just going to type here in my comment because that tells me when I come back to revising this, all I have to do is hit my little comics button, go to the last one that says here, click, boom, I'm right where I left off. So anyway, hopefully that was helpful for some of you to see how I uh, rework some of these scenes to make them make logistically more sense, but also more sense from the perspective that I'm trying to tell the story from. So anyway, that we're, that's going to do it for a real-time revision today. Um, thanks for sticking around and uh, listening to somewhat of what I'm working on with my own uh, writing, and I hope it helps you in some way with yours. Thanks again for being a member of the Patreon team, and uh, we'll catch up with you next week with another real-time revision. Thanks. Thanks.